So we will now um, move on to our next speaker, and I'm um, delighted to introduce uh, Professor Julian Reed from the University of Copenhagen, um, who will be talking to us about the background and status of the Ur Ziggurat. And I think your PowerPoint will be shared now. So William Loftus, who visit, visited Ur in 1850, stated that the structure we now know as the ziggurat or temple tower was the only example of a Babylonian temple remaining in good condition, not wholly covered by rubbish. There it is. In the 1850s, there were three seasons of excavation at Orr by John Taylor. And then Harry Hall, who excavated there in 1919, later described how the ziggurat of Orr stands up on the edge of the desert like an Egyptian pyramid, which superficially it much resembled before the rubbish heaped up round its base had been removed by Mr. Woolley, and the great steps on its northeast face had been revealed. According to Leonard Woolley, Hall, Hall demonstrated the imperative necessity of excavating the best preserved example of a ziggurat in Mesopotamia. And it's largely as the consequence of his work that the joint expedition was formed. So next, please. And so then it's with the uh, physical prominence of the ziggurat and the, that led to all Woolley's other remarkable discoveries at Orr during 1922 to 1934. He worked on and around the ziggurat through many seasons and confirmed its identity as the prime visible monument of Sumerian civilization. And it still retains this status which is why this colloquium demands a paper on the ziggurat. Uh, there are a few matters that may deserve a fresh look. There was a reluctance in the 1920s to remove any of the brickwork that remained in position. Therefore, Woolley examined the exterior of the ziggurat, but couldn't explore its internal structure and antecedents. He made his usual ex excellent job of recording and interpreting his observations and publishing them promptly. The ziggurat was dedicated to Nana, the moon god, god of Or. It had been commissioned by Or Namu, the first king of the third dynasty of Or, towards the end of the third millennium BC, and completed by his son Shulgi. It was repaired with alterations several times, notably some 1,500 years later by Nabonidus of Babylon, a keen devotee of the moon god. These names are attested by inscribed bricks and cylinders in position. Onamu's ziggurat was basic, basically a block of brickwork uh, image. Please, constructed with at least two stages. The walls tapered slightly upwards, and Woolley thought that they incorporated entices for visual effect. A lower, a lower stage me measures slightly over 60 by 40 meters in area and 10 meters in height, perhaps 120, 80, and 20 cubits. The area of the upper stage may have corresponded to 70 and 50 cubits. These proportions exemplify the geometrical relationships characteristic of elite Meso Mesopotamian architecture in the following centuries. Woolley also proposed that, at least in the restoration by Nabonidus, there was good evidence for four colors. The walls of the surrounding temple buildings were plastered white. The lower stage of the ziggurat itself was black, 
the color of the bitumen covering the bricks, hence its Arabic name, al Mugayr. The surviving mud bricks of the upper stage were red, and because this color was exceptional at all, he proposed that the external walls had been red too. And blue glazed bricks found in the debris derived from an upper part of the monument as restored by Nabonidus. And Woolley discussed the possible significance of these colors. It is supposed that there was originally a shrine on top where the moon god in some form was present. Access to the shrine was provided on the northeast side by one large central staircase and two narrower side staircases. The central staircase was presumably used on ceremonial occasions and the others for services. For example, buildings around the base included kitchens, recalling the fine shrine beside the contemporary ziggurat at Nippur, where meals for the god could have been prepared. How the shrine on top should be restored is uncertain. Woolley thought that it stood on top of a third upper stage. Slide. He also proposed that in the final form of the ziggurat in the 6th century, there were no less than seven cent stages. He reached this figure by measuring the volume of fallen, fallen debris at Or and by postulating a parallel with the seven-staged ziggurat recorded at Babylon, but that must be doubtful. Ernst Heinrich, on the other hand, noted that if or Namu's ziggurat included a third stage, then its top can only have measured some 10 by 20 meters, which would only have allowed for a small single room shrine on top. He preferred to put the shrine directly on top of the second stage, as in next slide, with its more spacious area of 36 by 26 meters, so that Heinrich's ziggurat is simpler and more like the traditional type of ele elevated temple from which the design of ziggurats surely derives. Heinrich's version is more plausible, but is an inconspicuous drawing in a technical book. I've enhanced the lines in the version now on screen. Modern reports and websites which feature or which out pursu without pursuing academic detail tend to employ the woolly version. It is known, accessible, and effectively self-perpetuating. A conspicuous feature of the ziggurat was the extensive use of fired brick. While its core was made of sun-dried mud brick, the lower stage was entirely surrounded by a skin of durable fired bricks. This seems to have been a significant innovation. The quality of the, mud, of the fired bricks and the skill of the masons who laid them, coupled with later changes in the course of the river Euphrates, um, or Tigris, or whatever we like to call the delta, which meant there were no permanent human settlements in close vicinity, have been, they've been responsible for the survival of the ore ziggurat in such good condition. And that is one reason why its, its status is sometimes likened to that of the pyramids in Egypt as a structure of comparable age and staying power. Much of the brickwork was reinforced and partly covered during modern restoration beginning in the 1960s, and that is what the visitor now sees. There's no suggestion of the previous black color. Slide. It's plain that conservation was essential to protect the structure, and the result is visually impressive, but it raises questions over authenticity to which there is no easy answer. 
The good condition of the Ur ziggurat and some Egyptian pyramids has also led to the supposition that one of these two forms of architecture was inspired by the other. Wondering about the current status of the popular debate, I consulted the Wikipedia entry on the ziggurat in August 2022 and read that its step design was definitely based on that of the step pyramid at Saqqara. However, when I returned to check the source of that statement two days later, it had gone. And I read instead that the, that the step design of the pyramid at Saqqara might have been borrowed from the Mesopotamian ziggurat con concept. That reference too later disappeared. Now, there, there is plenty of evidence for whatever reasons, military, slide, commercial, or other, for connections between early dynastic Or and the West. Jars from North Syria, please, clearly containing a marketable liquid like wine or perfume, were described by Woolley as characteristic of royal tombs. Stones made for vessels in one tomb include both lapis lazuli from Afghanistan and obsidian from Anatolia. Please. In another, there are seemingly Levantine weapons. Please. A large bronze plaque is embossed with triumphant lions in a manner which several experts have associated with Egypt. Please. These are valid observations, but concern an earlier period and do not directly affect the design of the ziggurat at all. Yet there is one technical feature of this building, reflecting a different set of relationships, those between Or and the lands of the Persian Gulf. One reason for the importance of cities like Or, Lagash and Susa lay in their geographical position at the head of the Gulf and consequent access to the metal that was most valuable for all practical purposes, copper imported from the Southeast. This brought them into contact with the Indus civilization, whose people had their own interests in the Gulf. The relationships, amply illustrated by texts and by items like bleached carnelian beads in the royal graves, please, have been studied by many colleagues. They continued long after the early dynastic period. Because the ziggurat at Or made extensive use of fired bricks as a sturdy exterior skin, and because fired bricks were already used in great quantities in the principal cities of the Indus Valley, as in this image, please, of the great bath at Mohenjo-Daro, it seems to me not unlikely that the novel idea of using them on such a scale at all was adopted from the Indus. So that, that is an alternative external influence. Other ramifications in Orr's relationships with the East may be summarized in a poorly recorded foundation deposit apparently made by the early dynastic king Aani Pada for a temple dedicated to Inanna. The deposit deserves attention because the inscription is persistently omitted from publications of early royal texts, and the entire deposit seems to have been omitted from the entry for Or in the 2015 Rea Lexicon. The deposit as shown in this image, please, 
where the items are of various scales, incorporated a stone weight of a very peculiar type. Whatever the exact context, it is based on models from eastern Iran, and its association with a king and a temple at Or raises the question of how deep was Or's involvement then in Gulf affairs. There could even have been precedents then for the aggressive involvement of old Akkadian kings in the same region soon afterwards. This kind of evidence accumulates to offer a, pic a picture of Ur of Or in the, Ur in the earlier, early dynastic three period as a great power with far-flung interests and influence. The, comparisons, but the comparison between that and the following two centuries or so is drastic. Late in the early dynastic period, Or became part of Lugal Zagas's empire. Thereafter, it was repeatedly rebelling against foreign rule. Princesses from Agade and Lagash became priestesses of Nana. Whatever the details, there was a long series of humiliations for the elite of Or, possibly felt by the entire population. At least two royal statues, please, were attacked with impressive ferocity. One flake from a head on the left probably belonged to an Akkadian king, the other perhaps to a Gudea. Part of a chair, perhaps from the same Gudea, attests, please, incidentally, to another type of archaeology, the collection of souvenirs by visiting soldiers, this now being in a British uh, military museum. Paradoxically, the weakness of ore in the late early dynastic Akkadian and post-Akkadian periods provides an excellent reason for Or Namu's construction of the ziggurat, and indeed for the ostentatious magnificence of all his other buildings at Or and elsewhere. Through these projects, Or Namu, supported by his son Shulgi, was doing several things. He was offering a triumphant response to those who, over the previous two centuries, had been involved in humiliating Sumerian ore. He was presenting ore as the grandest and most powerful of Mesopotamian and Gulf cities. He was creating an architectural counterpart to his far-reaching administrative reforms. And he was establishing himself through buildings inscribed with endless repetitions of his personal name as a ruler chosen by God. His ziggurat aspired to recall a glorious past, to celebrate current glory, and to remain relevant for generations to come. For 1500 years, down to the reign of Nabonidus, his aspirations were successful, and they remain so today. The consequence, please, is that even though there is no reason to suppose an ancient link between the ziggurat of Or and any of the African pyramids, the two kinds of monument have acquired comparable status in the popular histories of Iraq and Egypt. In the days of paper mail, they were both commemorated on widely distributed postage stamps. They even look better together than the ziggurat of Or paired with its closer relative at Mahenjo-daro, please. All three types of monument remain vulnerable to ideological hostility, but barring this, they will presumably continue to be publicized 
in whatever form future technology may provide as timeless national achievements. Thank you. Julian, thank you very much indeed. That was uh, a, a wonderful contextualization of the ziggurat in antiquity and now. And I think um, uh, a, a, a fabulous journey which took us, of course, beyond Mesopotamia and um, linking us back, as, as I had suggested, through Woolley's quotes with um, the Indus. So um, it, it's great to have that, that relationship established. Are there any questions um, from that um, wonderful talk? Please do drop them in the human day. Nothing appears at the moment. You've you've uh, overloaded them with ideas, no doubt. <laughs> so, um, uh, I think we can probably therefore. Um, uh, as is the nature with these uh, virtual uh, talks, uh, silently clap, uh, uh, applause um, your contribution, and thank you very much indeed, Julian, for that. Thank you.